Right, so our last session for today is all about um, high on wellness. So this is exploring how wellness programs throughout the corporate travel experience can improve safety, increase engagement, and enhance the traveler's overall health. Let's gain some collective insights from our experts on the future of wellness and travel. I'd like to welcome to the stage, please, Martin Gallagher from the, uh, he's the regional director for sales and operations for Southeast Asia from Hilton. Martin, come on up, thanks. I'd also like to welcome up Todd Arthur. Todd is the vice president for Asia Pacific Sabre. Welcome, Todd. And do we have Dr. Walter Lim, Deputy Country Managing Director for Singapore from Fullerton Health? Thanks very much. Even flexible 
in all four of our people's personal needs, and health and safety will be a very important and managed program. And can I just, when you say travelers will have a little more power than they had in the past, just explain that a little bit. Well, I think, you know, you look at, you know, every company that was earlier mentioned about what, um, what you're doing to kind of, in India, build up a, a new team. And so we've seen, you know, uh, you know, attrition levels that we've never seen before. So as a result, companies are doing things to they make sure they're taking care of their staff and doing things, flexibility that we've never seen before. And I think that will be um, a really important part to say, hey, you know, we value these employees. And maybe in the past we said, you know, you can't stay at that property, but if the employee says, hey, I think it's, you know, I feel more comfortable there, um, I think you'll see companies being a lot more flexible with the travel policy. Really good point. Thanks, Todd. Um, Walter, just coming across to you, what uh, are you seeing at Fullerton Health coming out of the pandemic and some trends and changes, particularly when it comes to health of travellers or just the general public, actually? Yes, and so it's a pleasure being here today because uh, I've been uh, asked a number of times in the last two years. It's really quite a day that uh, travel can resume in the future. I think it's a pleasure to finally be there almost at the moment. So the demand, the demand for travel certainly is there. And what we're seeing there is that uh, people need a psychological safety net. But if something happens when I travel, so COVID fully has seen uh, sort of the last of COVID. Uh, but we are seeing that our regional clients are uh, thinking ahead before they travel on a trip around the region, uh, some key markets. Uh, if something happens, what is the outpatient medical network we can access? Is it a trusted network? How do we look at it? So these are simple questions, very much as one would think about accommodation, flights, or even uh, family options. And we are seeing that. We want to travel the desire is there. We want to provide the safety net as well. Uh, what we are doing in Fulton is that at least in the key markets we're in, making sure that it's a trusted network. So one has to have minor symptoms, even minor symptoms like a cough and cold. One wonders is it is it COVID? So we need to find out. Uh, of course we still have the ubiquitous uh, great travel testing that still exists, you know, it's becoming easier. So uh, again uh, we want to go ahead and making sure that on, on the outbound trip and return trip people know where to go. So I think travel for sure, hopefully, by the moment. Uh, importantly, we want to provide a safety net and at least, in our view, an intangible sense of uh, protection and wellness when people finally buy the ticket and they take the flight out. And we, we hope to get the country out to fall in one piece. So that's, that's, really, that's really what we're going to see. And uh, as a medical provider, I think, uh, at post pandemic, it's one of the fixture of travel plans that have been there for some time to come. I guess it's about everybody getting more comfortable with the fact that it's there for some time to come. But we are seeing a hard and fast with restrictions, which is great, and Singapore lifting the requirements for uh, pre travel testing uh, coming back into Singapore, which is certainly making it easier to move back. I, I think there's something to that when they move, they have moved quite fast. And sometimes faster than everybody can respond. But that's something that it's a, it's a good news story. It's a, I, um, I just recently travelled back from New Zealand and I think within two weeks time I had changed my uh, ability to need to have a pre-travel COVID test to being able to do it virtually for $20 which was fantastic from 150 which was a charge in New Zealand and then uh, within a couple of days that was removed altogether so I got to cancel the test as well which was great and re-enter the country without that need so we are seeing those changes which is fantastic. I just want to come back to you, um, Martin, down the end, because we know that Hilton has been focused on health and wellness and personalization prior to COVID. This is not a new thing for Hilton. But how has the last 24 months changed your approach, and in what ways has it impacted um, the views of Hilton on the future of travel wellness? Thanks, Vicky. I'll, I'll stick with three main, main uh, I would call them customer insight, right? So the first, I would say, is that Overall focus on wellness will span beyond the gym. So if you think about health and wellness, we all talk about you know you know a gym, a, a spa, in a hotel. You know that's that's health and wellness for me. One of the things that we've seen with our travelers over the past few months as this recovery has has gone through was that they're now seeing travelers travel less versus what they did before, but they're now staying longer. So what that means is they you, you basically have these travelers have what I would call grounded travel, where they mix in you know, business and leisure. We call it leisure, right? But that's also where you start seeing, you know, how can you how can you help 
support them as they start having these longer trips, where they can actually start looking at you know decompressing or even traveling after you know the past 24 months. What we have um, in Hilton, what we do have are what we call Hilton Honors experiences. These are experiences that you know you can see at our Hilton Honors app. It's something that you can look at. So if you go to a hotel in Singapore, as an example, the hotel has and you know they have various honors experiences that you can leverage and you know depending on your case whether you want to do an art tour whether you want to look at sights and sounds that's something that begins to get integrated in some of the offerings that we have now if i take you to the maldives where we have a couple of really nice properties one of the things that we do have in the world of Astoria maldives is having a what we call a wellness concierge so as much as you go to the maldives to do r and r there's also that one concierge where you can actually have a discussion with an individual and basically say, what can I do outside of a gym and a spa that we can leverage in the world's wellness? And they curate a fantastic program for you on your stay. So whether or not you stay in our city hotels or resorts, there's something about looking at what more can I do outside of the gym and spa, uh, especially at home. The second piece that I also want to, you know, talk about is you're seeing a, uh, what I would call a savvier traveler as it pertains to, you know, how they start looking at the scenes, right? So when you start looking at, you know, the way people start to eat, there's a, there's a more, um, there's a demand and a hunger for, I would call it healthier eating or healthier cuisine. So you'll see that in, in our meetings, uh, on our meeting today, right, you see these little, um, the new that we have, which is pretty much more sustainable. Uh, but also at the same time, if you start looking at some of our hotels, we have the Comrade Kosamui, which is I think a great example of, during the pandemic, they decided to actually start building a farm. They call it the Iris Farm, where essentially when you start talking about farm-to-table experiences, they can deliver you know, farm-to-table experiences, and also at the same time start looking at how they can even make a difference in the world with the ability for them to start, you know, using, you know, compost in terms of the food waste that happens. So again, as you start looking at, you know, how do we look at, you know, healthier options? Our hotels have started looking at that. Our hotels have started customizing it as well. But also, some of our hotels have invested, you know, pretty much in terms of how can I build like a, a little farm, such as the one that Tom and this movie has. And last, last but not the least is there is also a sense of caring, a new, a new sense of caring that is emerging and which is getting stronger. And what I mean by that is because we've been so out of it for the past couple of years, people are starting to desire to reconnect, right? So I'm sure, I mean, I'm, I've been a traveler myself over the past few months. One of the things that I did, the first thing that I did was to reconnect with my family over, you know, this is the first time in three years. And it's really based on the fact that people just want to connect. So if you think about connecting with people, you know, how do you start looking at leveraging that? We know that when you start connecting with people or our loved ones or our family members, hopefully we can look at it from a you know from a bigger size type of gathering. But what we do have in Hilton is we, we do have our connected routes availability where to us we launched it last year, but it was really more because we knew that people wanted to start booking rooms where they could have instant confirmation on you know connected rooms. And that was something that we saw was, was something that families stuck on because they wanted to make sure that whether or not it's their grandparents, you know, their their extended families being able to be together, at least in a couple of rooms, was something that they found really but more than that as well, I think, Vicky, when we talk about that new sense of caring, it started to become more than just, you know, me, myself, and I. It was about how can I make a difference in the world pre-pandemic. And that's where Hilton has their travel with purpose. So if you really think about travel with purpose, it's not just about making a difference for yourself, but it's also about how we can partner with each and every one of you to look at, you know, how can we make a difference for the hotel also at the same time to the communities that we're a big part of. Uh, and you'll see a lot of those programs, you'll see your water bottles in front of you that says meet with purpose. You know, we talk about sustainable meetings, we talk about carbon offset programs. But also as we talk about travel with purpose, there's also that component where, you know, when people start talking about health and wellness, they also start looking at it from a perspective of how can I help support other people in their health and wellness journey as well. 
So I, maybe for me, right, those are the three main things that I've seen, and those are the three things that we as Skeleton has looked at and started to see you know, how we could be a part of the new 2022 project. Coming back to you, John, so as I said, you guys have access to a wealth of data. What trends can you share with us around changes and booking patterns? Yeah, it was interesting when I was um, listening to uh, the comments around China, like you know, thinking about people were booking kind of last minute. And that's the trends that we saw up until you know, fairly recently. Because the uncertainty, like book something, and then you know, we saw this a lot in Australia where uh, you book a domestic trip, and then all of a sudden the borders are closed and people will be stuck. And so people were, you know, the, the, the advanced purchase time, the advanced you know, the booking was very, very short. Um, and that has changed very rapidly. It's actually quite surprising uh, that all of a sudden now people are worried about, as Bert kind of mentioned, about taking in space, or a picture that you're on a uh, supplier that you want to fly on or stay in. It's uh, becoming harder now. So we're seeing, starting to see a lot more advanced work than we've ever seen, uh, seen before. We still see extraordinary kind of shopping uh, based on uh, a news will come out that Thailand, for example, is either relaxing or re completely removing restrictions. And overnight, we see significant uh, people just looking uh, and looking at you know kind of a flat option. So we know that the demand is there, um, but it is really interesting to see how these kind of advanced uh, purchase uh, has really changed since you know kind of rules are relaxed and now all of a sudden it's doing actually what every travel manager in the room wanted to do before is like let's get people to book do well in advance and that's happening now for not probably not the reasons that we anticipated it being. Yeah, I, we're definitely seeing that at FCM as well, like especially at the same for that booking window is extended heavily. Um, and I think that there is just a chain of want and need to get everything logged in earlier. I think at the very start of the return to travel, that was more about ensuring that they had enough time to be, travelers had enough time to be very clear on the restrictions, what the requirements were around testing and all of those things. Um, and now it's more just around seats and imagery and, and getting things logged in uh, earlier, I think, around pricing as well. Yeah. I remember the first time I flew here out of Europe, um, on July 11th, I'll never forget that date. I you know, had 18 months without being on a plane. And I went out to Cheney you know, with a, like, a stack of papers you know, like this, and like duplicates and all this stuff. And I've only recently, in the, you know, my most recent trip, gotten comfortable with like not having any documents. It's like just on my phone. And uh, so you're right, it used to be like you know, really need the plan and, and the search for information. And that's what we're also seeing is. Uh, our managers, companies are going like, hey, we want to be able to have a consolidated place to know where we can go for what I need to be able to travel. And I think that's going to be really important. And I know that um, that you have a high center that's seeing a lot of tools around supporting the um, corporations and those uh, kind of information. Yeah, and, and that's true. We partnered uh, globally with Sherpa um, very early on after the pandemic hit. Um, and that was to make sure that we had tools that both our travelers could access directly to find out um, in live time updates on travel requirements, restrictions, and what was a really heavily dynamic kind of environment at that stage. Um, but also for our travel consultants to be able to utilize at speed to be able to give our travelers and their rangers the necessary information. Um, in a really digestible way as well, and, and this is crucial. But I think the best news for travel consultants today, especially um, our teams, is with those restrictions dropping, there's a lot less to consider now when it comes to travelers um, and, and all of those restrictions and testing requirements. So that is becoming easier, but um, having tools like Sherpa at your fingertips is going to be, I think, an, an ongoing necessity for some time yet. Particularly here in this region, if you look at the entire Asian Pacific region, 74% of travel is international, right? And so that's unique in every other uh, place in the world. Um, even though you can say that most of the travel in Europe is international, but they have the Schengen common borders, they don't have the same restrictions. So it's more important in the Asian Pacific region than, than any place globally. Sure. Um, okay, so just a quick question for each of you, and we can stay with you, Todd, if you like, since you've got a microphone. Um, what is one thing that you would suggest that travel managers should be focusing on when it comes to considering the wellness of their travelers? Yeah, I, I, I bring this, uh, brought this up earlier. I think is the, the flexibility of, of the program. 
because everyone's going to get back into travel for the first time. They're going to be uh, have different levels of, of different levels of comfort, and I think you have to have flexibility um, in this kind of day and time to get people back on the road to be concerned around uh, you know, people are concerned about their own illness and, uh, and and their safety and security. Uh, so it's uh, I think it's going to be really important for travel managers to have that flexibility with their program. Uh, and over time, you know, the programs will mature post-COVID, but it will be at some time that we will need to be uh, flexible with our team. And, and when you say flexibility, do you mean in um, in the way that um, their travelers can travel, or the way that we arrange meetings? You talked earlier about you know Patron's um, messaging earlier about travel. Uh, periods extending, so stays extending um, to what they were before. And I think in a previous conversation, Martin, you mentioned that the average stay at Hilton has moved for business travelers from kind of three three days to a week currently. So is that around flexibility, Todd, in um, you know, arranging meetings or was it the way that they're traveling? Well, I think that's one component. The other component, maybe, I mean, just the, something that popped in my head, maybe when Hong Kong opens back up again, and I know we're all excited to get back to Hong Kong again. Maybe your policy was when you arrive at, at the airport, you've got to take the train uh, in. And so maybe someone says, hey, you know, I don't necessarily feel comfortable taking the train. I want to take a taxi. It's going to cost 400 Hong Kong dollars versus the uh, price of the train. That's the level of flexibility I think that companies will need to have. If someone says, hey, I'm not really comfortable getting on a train or getting on a bus, which I would have been in the past, I would be more comfortable in a taxi or in a car service in the hotel that I know that has a certain level of a, a, a standard. I mean, we've always kind of been accepting of that in like India, for example, but maybe not in Japan, maybe in other markets. And I think that's the level of flexibility. It's, you know, it's not very strategic, it's very kind of tactical flexibility, which will be important. Yeah, great. And coming back to the earlier comment as well around uh, a little bit of the cards being in the hands of the travelers more so than those setting the policies moving forward for the foreseeable future. Great. Uh, Walter, what about you? What is uh, one piece of advice or something that you think that travel managers should be focusing on when it comes to the health of their travelers? Well, I would say uh, at some safety nets in place, I mentioned earlier. So, some tools that will help or keep trusted providers and the different markets, uh, as well as, uh, for example, digital aspects, for example, telemedicine can be very useful. Uh, that we, we can't necessarily deliver a medication across borders, but sometimes what you really need is medical advice. So I think by all means the travel should happen. Uh, but let's, uh, let's have some uh, safety nets just in case. Uh, I think what has shown us it doesn't hurt an abundance of caution. Uh, I think this will go a long way. Uh, really uh, assuage any concerns that freedom travelers may have or senior management that have to move around. And uh, then we believe uh, within Asia Pacific, given the diversity of the markets we have, you know, would be something that the medical industry can work very closely with together with the travel industry to make sure that Travel happens, but that is a way that learning from COVID, we really have all these uh, procedures, contingencies in place. Great, thank you. And uh, back to you, Martin. I'd like to think we're in the people serving people business. And to me, I think if, if I may not have emphasized this enough on, on the previous questions, to me, I think the one thing that we should be looking at is how do we become travel, you know, trusted, trusted advisors for these people and start avoiding that whole cookie cutter approach. And the reason why I say that is because when we start looking at, as we talk about health and wellness, the one thing I, that's very important for us that we may not have a lot of um, conversations around is the mental wellness aspect of travel. You know, I mean, you guys have been doing it already, but you know, as you start looking at the requirements, as you start looking at, you know, uncertainties, as you start looking at even traveler confidence. I think when we start adding all of those up, it, it, it really it really puts uh, you know that, that stress towards that middle of the sport about can I am I ready to travel again? So I think as as travel consultants, right, we need to look at it in terms of how can I make sure you're comfortable in traveling again until such a point in time that we can be you know fairly confident generally speaking that you know a lot of the things that we were used to pre-pandemic that is now coming back. So I would say that would be that would be the most thing I would look at. Have a travel centric perspective on you know the people that you that you work with and at the same time really to, to what the gentleman already said, 
you know, how do we make sure that we have all of these factors in play as we start talking about, you know, what's the most relevant part that'll be useful for the travelers that you 